So I want to thank you for joining me today is my friend Juan Riestra, a board-certified psychiatrist with over 30 years of experience and a Latin music enthusiast. And today I'm excited to talk about cultural-based stigmas of mental health and the value of professional mental health. Dr. Juan, as I affectionately refer to him, and I actually worked together in a hospital setting for over 10 years. He has a distinguished career and is a well-recognized practitioner in New Jersey. He's blushing here as I say these nice things about him. He's a, trained at Cornell University, a proud husband, and a father of three young adults. I want to personally thank you for making time from your busy day to join me today on their sum tour about it. Welcome to our show, Dr. Juan. Thank you so much. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, this is like we're going back to when we used to, you know, sit in a chair in the hospital and <laughs> talk about stuff and uh, try to f uh, fix the world. Absolutely. And, and I'm still that visionary. I still believe that when great minds come together, we can make great things happen. Uh, but before we get into that, I want to talk a little, about, a little bit about the human side of us. Now, your twins have graduated college. Yes. How does that make you oh, feel? Oh, that's amazing. That's the best <laughs> part of it. It's been, it's been a great year. Uh, they were affected by the pandemic, like all of us, and it sure. was a little harder. Uh, but they both graduated, and uh, they're doing great. They're working at a center for autistic kids. Oh, beautiful. And they're having a great time and learning a lot. And, uh, and uh, you know, they're about to apply to medical school. Wow. They'll become a doctor, too. Wow, and, wow. And my oldest one is yes. a podiatry resident. Wow. So, so, you, you've done a couple things right in this life. Uh, my wife and I, you know, <laughs> we work very hard. Uh, we, we had our priorities straight. And unfortunately, our children, you know, seem to be headed the right way as well. Beautiful, beautiful. And let me just offer another thank you for really being one of our healthcare heroes through the pandemic. Uh, stay in the course, not leaving the field. And we know that had to be challenging for you, but thank you for sticking with it. You're welcome. You're welcome. I don't feel like a hero. I just feel like I did my job. And uh, and uh, I, I continue to try to help all of those who were right in the front lines. Uh, this, kind, this pandemic affected all of us, but especially it was hard uh, on the nurses and the ER doctors and the first respondents. Uh, they really have suffered a lot, and they're still suffering, and they need, uh, they need us to remember them and to continue to help them for, for years to come. Absolutely. And, and these are the things that we'll have to build into. So hearing that your children are interested in medicine, uh, when uh, some of the statistics and reports have stated that people are leaving the healthcare profession because they can't take another wave of working through the pandemic, didn't sign up for this. Uh, and as you indicated, you know, this is the work that you do. It's a part of your being. So uh, how does that make you feel? And what are you seeing being boots on the ground? There are a lot of people who are burning out mm -hmm. and who are leaving the field, and, and, and it is horrible. And, and, and those of us who are in the mental health field are trying to, to rally and to help because it would be a shame to lose good doctors and good nurses uh, to, to, to a pandemic. Um, and, and, you know, the most important thing is people who go into the medical field, they want to help people. Absolutely. You don't go into the medical field because you want to make millions. You go into the medical field because you want to help people. But someone has to help the helper. Someone has to help those who are sacrificing so much for the health of others. And that's when, you know, the mental health uh, profession and the mental health field can really uh, make a difference uh, for them. I think that the most important part is to help our nursing students and our medical students sure. and our residents uh, uh, realize that they can't lose their innocence and their hope and their dreams to the stress and to the realities of a very, very difficult world. So how do you help people maintain their, their ideals sure. while they're going through difficult times? I think that's part of how we, we help them. Uh, not get burned out and disillusioned. So that's a lot to be said. Easier said. Easier said than, than done. <laughs> than Absolutely. Done. <laughs> Much easier said than done. You know, yeah. but, but having uh, trained, skilled professionals such as yourself with years in, 
mm-hmm. lived through some things, mm-hmm. right? Lived through mm-hmm. some some fears, some phobias, um, and it helps us to pivot right into the cultural barriers. Yes. Right. Understanding that uh, people of color uh, typically don't seek mental health treatment. Uh, They look to talking it out with families or even just sucking it up. Right. It's the way it is. I can deal with it. I can power through. Um, Mm -hmm. I've heard that countless times. But using a professional shouldn't have any stigma in 2022. Uh, Do you have any thoughts in and I know you've given lectures on this yes, topic, yes, but if yes. we could break it down for our audience, that would be amazing. I think that, that the simplest way to look at this is lack of knowledge mm. and prejudice, okay? Oh, when knowledge you have and prejudice, no, huh? Lack of knowledge and prejudice, you know, we call it, I, I, don't, I, I could say ignorance, but that has ramifications of, you know, people think that you're being insulting. That's not what I mean. Lack of knowledge and understanding. Yes. And prejudice, you can't soften that because prejudice is prejudice. Okay. So people do not understand that mental illness is no different from physical illness and they look at it differently. And then you have prejudice against people with mental illness. So there's prejudice against people of color plus prejudice against people with mental illness, it creates a horrible com- a horrible combination. Absolutely. That, so we're hit twice. And it's sometimes deadly. Sometimes yes. it's literally deadly. So how do you solve this is with knowledge and with lack of prejudice. <laughs> what was the opposite of prejudice? <laughs> yes. Uh, enlightenment. Yes. Right? Enlightenment. enlightenment. Yes. So first we need to understand that who we are, okay? We, we think who we are is really created by the brain, okay? Uh, the, the heart pumps blood, the lungs breathe. Our brain creates who we are, and it creates consciousness. We are a consciousness, and there's three things we do with that. We think things, you know, we know where the Costco is, so, and we know, we know how to drive to it. That's, and we, we know we, gas prices are too much. And we know gas prices are going up, so <laughs> we know things. We also feel things. Yes. We know that we love our partner. We love that we are angry with someone. We yes. know that we are fearful of something, and we act. Mm-hmm. It, we call it cognition, affect, and behavior. So it's we think, we feel, and we act. The fact that, you know, I know, you know, that if someone is crying next to me, I should stand up, walk towards them and hug them and give them comfort. Sure. Right. It's, it's all controlled by the brain or created mm-hmm. in the brain. So there's a biological component, a medical component sure. to all kinds of emotional distress and emotional problems. But that's not enough in order to understand this. There's also a familiar component. Yeah. Who you are depends on who was your family. Right. What was your relationship with your family members? Was it a healthy family? Was a stressed family? Mm. Was a family that had more difficult than other families? So families also make us. But also society. Did we grow in a place where the schools were good, the services were available, there was a fruit Mm -hmm. stand next to us? Or did we grow in a place that was a food desert? And, you you know, we were all stressed out because the ambulances were were, were going off all day long. You could hear shots. You know, where we grow really makes us and makes a difference. So there is a biological component, there's a familial component, and there is a social component. But there's also cultural component. Some cultures are more accepting of differences. Some cultures are more uh, stern Mm -hmm. and they make you feel that, you know, any kind of mental illness is a defect or a a weakness. And some cultures are a little bit more tolerant uh, from that. And then we have the problem of immigration. Mm. When you leave from the place where you were born and the language where you were born and you move to another place, it's very stressful. Absolutely. Nobody leaves uh, without some degree of stress. And I'm going to add migration to that. Yes, yes, right. absolutely. Migration with migration yes. is even leaving that small community in the South, migrating north as African Americans did for better opportunities. Absolutely. It has an impact. Right. And. We all leave where we were uh, because of reasons. Sure. And then we come to where we are looking for a better world, a better opportunity. But then we have to confront all those barriers. Okay. Yes. So cultural barriers are difficult 
to to eliminate. And we need to eliminate them with knowledge, right? The mm-hmm. understanding that the same way that if you have diabetes or hypertension, you take your medicine to get that better. If you have depression or anxiety, you also take your medications. Sure. I tell my patients when they don't want to take a medication, wait a minute, if you have a headache, you take Tylenol, right? That's right. Yes. That's and right. Tylenol is actually more dangerous than antidepressants. So so there's a, there's a disconnect here. Right, right. right. And, you know, we're fortunate to live uh, at a time where therapy is available. We know what good therapy is. Medications are available. Right. We know what good medication is. And our newer medications are safer, mm-hmm. much less side effects, and they are very effective. So, you know, if you break a leg... Uh, nobody's going to say, oh, don't put a cast, you know, uh, you know, suffer through it, you know, you know be strong. Mm-hmm. Nobody says that. But when you have a se- when something horrible happens to you right. and you develop a depression, uh, everybody says, well, suck it up. Get over it, it. Get over it. Yes, move on. But that's a lack of understanding of what depression actually is. And it's a lack of tolerance mm. to the suffering of, of the specific patient. Instead, we should open up and say, oh, my God, this horrible thing happened to you. It is natural that you're not going to feel good. What do we do to help you? Do we give you therapy? Do we give you support? Do we give you medications? Do you need to be in the hospital for a few days to be able to, to, you know, uh, fix this? If you have a serious medical condition, nobody thinks twice about going to the ICU. That's true. Right? You go to the ICU because you need to. Right. If you are having suicidal thoughts that can end your life, you have to be you have to go somewhere where you'll be safe. Would you, you'll be safe, right? Yes. It might not be the hotel. Twenty four you know, hour uh, monitoring. Twenty four hour monitoring. It might not it's not gonna feel like you're at the Marriott. Right. 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 Because you know, mental health facilities are not plush. <laughs> Right, but, but it's a respite. But it's a respite, right. and it is a place where you're going to be safe. And I'm always, always surprised by the human spirit. Mm. When we get a human being who's had horrible things happen to, to, to him or her, and they have taken the decision that they're going to end their life mm. because they cannot deal with the pain anymore. Right. And they come to the hospital and, you know, we have nice nurses and nice techs and, you know, good doctors. Within a couple of weeks, they put their life together. Yes. And, and most of the time, they're ready to go back out and back to deal with these stressors. And now they're feeling better. They have been given uh, some skills mm-hmm. to manage the stress. And we have started some good medication. And, you know, they're back to fight. They're so, back to the fight. So I think, you know, a, a couple things here. You know, when we talk about the cultural barriers, the, the spirit, the willingness, the time. Right, because you're talking about uh, uh, folks uh, suffering from a lot of pressures, mm-hmm. housing mm-hmm. insecurity, mm-hmm. food insecurity, yes. right, economic yes. insecurity. I got to go to work because how am I going to pay for the roof? Losing your job. Over my family's head, right? Yes, having three jobs and not making enough. Absolutely. All pressures that become compounded mm-hmm. uh, that also keep people from seeking treatment, especially in communities of color, because the time is just not there. Right. Well, the problem is, okay, let's say you are a single mom Mm -hmm. and you have a couple of kids and there's no good daycare for you, right? That's a structural Uh, barrier. Yes. You can't go to the doctor. You can't bring along the kids. I mean, you could actually, (laughs) you know, you can, but it's not the best for the kids and it's not the best for you. Right. So you have one one barrier there. You don't have any good daycare. Mm -hmm. Second barrier, you you work in two, three jobs at minimum wage to be to be able to keep your your house. Yes. Third, there's no good place next to you, right? Right. You, there's no availability. Right. And even if there is a hospital, you don't know how access how to access those services. Biggest problem. Right. We have right. availability problems. Yes. So we have accessibility problems. Yes. And let's say you get there, and you know they look at you. You look different. 
from, you know, how you should look. And, yes. and now there's prejudice. Now you're not treated nicely. Right. 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 Let's say you go there, you have an accent, right? You came from the Caribbean. You came from, you know, another country. You come from some other place and you don't even understand what they're telling you. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. And they say, okay, we need a translator. Well, yeah, they have to find a translator, yes. right? Yes. And, and the interaction with the translator, sometimes it's not the same as if the doctor spoke your language. That's okay? right. That's or, right. Or the nurse or, or, or anybody. So there are so many structural barriers yes. for you to get the care that, that, that you seek. Um, and, and then they tell you, oh, no, this is not the place. You know, call this number. Oh, no, no, this is not the place. Call so this number. So you're running in a circle. You're running in a circle and your kids are crying and you're thinking, oh, my God, I'm going to be late for my next job. And, and then you say, okay, let's, right. I give up. Right. I, 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 you know, and then let's say eventually you get to the care that you need and you feel like a stranger. Yes. They, they, you feel like, oh, my God, uh, th this is a foreign world. Right. You really need at that point someone to, to be compassionate to you. To, to make you feel good, yes. to, 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 you know, help you through the process. And although there are many good professionals that do that, not enough. Right. We do not have enough, especially uh, in communities of, of color. We do not have enough services right. to provide to someone who is already stressed out mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. life is very, 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 very tough. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's just one example. And, and, and to that point, you know, some of the things we learned during the pandemic that opened up access, um, which I'm proud of, and, and was teletherapy. Mm -hmm. We never mm -hmm. thought that people would connect with being able to connect remotely with a therapist and a provider from their car, any place they could find a moment versus having to troop to some place uh, to get the care. I'm hoping those are some of the things that remain uh, post the pandemic uh, and being sure that they can connect with professionals uh, that they can count on. Because the other risk, and we saw this, was people were doing these web-based, you know, we, we deliver therapy, mm -hmm. um, and they were not necessarily legitimate sources. Yes. Yes, right. yes. The switch to teletherapy and telepsychiatry has been wonderful. It mm. has just in increased accessibility greatly. Uh, there are some times where I need to see the patient in person. Right. There are some interactions that are not the same. But a lot of the interactions can be done with teletherapy and with telepsychiatry. And it allows you to be able to see your doctor from home. Or, you know, be at work, take a 15-minute break, mm -hmm. talk to someone, take a half an hour break, right. talk to someone. Instead of having to take three hours off from work. Right. Or, you know, some people do not have the, the capacity of taking time off from work. They get fired. Right. That's, right. A, that's a complaint. It's a reality. A complaint that I have with my patients when I want to you know, get them to the hospital mm -hmm. or get them to a partial care program. They say, Doc. I'm going to get fired if right. I don't show up to, to work tomorrow morning. And so so that's another barrier that, and, that, that we have to deal and with. And as much as we work to make sure it's protected, right, mm -hmm. to, to, mm -hmm. to write notes and to treat it as a mm -hmm. physical ailment. Yes. Because as you mentioned, if they had diabetes, if they broke a limb, right, right you'd expect right. it to be reset, a couple days off mm -hmm. uh, for the healing process. The same for mental wellness. Where's the healing period? And I think culturally we're convinced that we have to be so hardworking that we don't verbalize the tensions that we face daily and how we cope with those things. And I'm going to pivot to something light a little bit because one of the things I always loved on a stressful day, Friday, 3 o'clock, the ER is just starting to fill up. Uh, and you come into the ER and you'd be singing and doing a little dance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Music is important. Music <laughs> heals the soul. Music is, is just this amazing thing. I've always told my friends, I modulate my mood by music. Oh, right? man. But, and it would change the whole spirit of, yes, of a hard yes, day. Yes, Every yes, ER yes, bay filled yes. uh, with a little Latin enthusiast yeah, and a yeah, little two-step. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is not too uncommon in Puerto Rico for people to sing while they work. 
Ah. So there's a little bit of a cultural <laughs> thing here because I grew up down in Puerto Rico. And in Puerto Rico, you, you see people singing all the time, even at go. work. There you go. So it's a little bit of a cultural uh, a legacy that I have. And, mm-hmm. and I decided not to get rid of it. And it's very funny when my social workers sometimes, you know, say to me, you know, Dr. Riestra, you're easy to find. We just follow the music <laughs> and we find you. And, uh, and, and it's important. If you're feeling a little melancholic, you could hear, you know, you could listen to a little romantic music. If you want to pick go. me up, you listen to a little salsa, a little merengue. Hey. Um, you know, I'm, of course, I'm talking about, you know, uh, rhythms that are a little older. <laughs> <laughs> but there's nothing wrong with, you know, That's being it. a little older. <laughs> right. Right. Um, and uh, music is very important. Um, and uh, all music is good. Yes. Okay. I mean, yes. I have my, my special preferences for Puerto Rican music okay. and, and Latin music and yes. uh, Brazilian music is amazing. Mm-hmm. We have all kinds of we have all kinds of rhythms, uh, music from Latin America. Absolutely. Um, I also prefer music that has some kind of social content. I was going to say, social content and telling a story. Yes, yes, yes. For that, we can also talk about country music. Oh, yeah. You will say, well, how (laughs) how does this Puerto Rican guy like country music? Right, right. Right. Country music, uh, first of all, you can understand the lyrics because they announce, (laughs) they they, they pronounce, right? Right, right. And and they always have a story. Always a story. It's a love story or a bad love story or a good love story. Mm -hmm. So for that matter, I like country music as well. There you go. Although I gravitate more towards uh, Latin jazz and and Brazilian uh, but you know all music is good there is always a nice beat and rhythm to it in jazz when I was younger right I, I wanted some r and I wanted a mm-hmm. little hip hop as yes. I've gotten a little more mature even though there's no age to jazz uh, because beats are sampled uh-huh. uh, from there as well but I just found it, it really just tempers my spirit it helps me to process things better, especially on mm-hmm. a on a long, hard day. Yes, um, and it's therapeutic. It is very therapeutic. Uh, you know, sometimes we could get so busy uh, that we have very little time for for therapeutic therapeutic things. Yes, uh, but you know, the half an hour of my drive to work and the half an hour of my drive from work mm-hmm. that's the time I listen to music. There you go. You know, and right. uh, and that's like. Uh, I don't know, uh, a daily meditation, <laughs> half hour in the morning, half hour in the afternoon, right. where you're going to listen listen to music. Um, and I'll, you know, put a, uh, 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 a word about how a music, it's sure. healing, it's wonderful, but it's also cultural. Mm-hmm. And, and the beautiful thing about Puerto Rican music, music from the island of Puerto Rico, is that it's a, it's a blend. It's a blend of three different uh, ethnic groups, ah, right? So yes. We have the Spanish guitars, we have the African drums, that's right, and then we have the you know Indian uh, instruments. Yes. And in Puerto Rico, the best music from Puerto Rico blends yes. all these cultures, and and it sort of signifies what we are. Yes. Okay. Yes. We are a a, a mixed uh, group of ethnically similar people, and uh, it is just beautiful to see how we have as many colors as the rainbow and we are all Puerto Ricans. Yes, yes. So so the so the music symbolizes what we are as a people. Right? Right, right. Now I'm talking about Puerto Ricans because right. that's where I come from, but it's also the same for all people. And I was waiting for that point. Yes. Because it's it's the one cultural unifier music. Mm-hmm, you mm-hmm. can have an appreciation of another ethnicity's music, find yes. common ground, same for food, um, and bringing that into the mix to combat stigmas mm-hmm. is critical mm-hmm. uh, as we look to be more inclusive yes. and enlightened is yes. the word you used earlier. Yes. And accepting. Tolerance and acceptance. Yes. It's 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 very, very important. Um for a while, I also I get into uh, moods. I had a, a mood of <laughs> listening to international music, ah. and, and my friends used to make fun of me. I said, "You know, Juan, you only like music you don't understand." <laughs> And that is right. the beauty of music. You don't need to understand the language That's true. To, to, to understand the, the feeling of the song. And the intonations, right? Yes. The highs yes. and the lows. Yes. I do recall that about you. What are they yeah. saying? Yes. <laughs> Translation. And the answer story. was, I don't know. It's just beautiful. And it vibrates right. and resonates. Absolutely. 
So maybe we could segue here sure. as to wellness. How do we take care of ourselves? Perfect. Right? Perfect. No? Absolutely. We talked a little bit about mental health mm-hmm. and how mental health is no different from physical health. That's right. But how do we take care of ourselves? The answer is actually very similar. We take care of our physical bodies and we take care of our uh, minds. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are ways of doing both, right? And if you do both, you actually live longer and uh, and you uh, live better. Because what what use is to be to live longer yes. if you're miserable? Absolutely, right. You, right, you right. live healthier, you live better, you live longer, and you live happier. Right. right? And, and what are some ways you can do that? Because I because I know one of the statements I use, especially post the pandemic, is I'm going to keep my peace. P E A C E. Yes. Right. Yes, it's yes, a protection because yes, yes, there's so much yes. coming at us, yes. so much noise, high intensity, but somehow we got to work to protect that. Number The number one thing is to realize that you have the right to take care of yourself, okay? Now, that's permission for yourself. Yes, absolutely. Mm. You have the right and you must have permission to take care for yourself. They, this, uh, they always have this an- analogy, which is you know maybe a little trite by now, but it's true. If you're in an airplane yes. and the airbags oh, come yes. out, the, the air, the oxygen, you put the oxygen on you first. That's right. And then you put the oxygen on everybody else. That's right. If you don't take care of yourself, how are you going to be able to take care of anybody else? That's true. Right. So, so you first of all, you need to recognize you have permission to care for yourself. And then you have to start learning limits, right? Oh, limit setting. Limit oh. setting. And no, it's okay. Yeah, no, it's okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. This is what I do, and this is what I don't do. Mm-hmm. This is what I'm willing, and this is what I'm not willing. That's right. Right? So you might not be willing to work 17 hours in a day. You right. might say, I'm willing to work 8, mm-hmm. or 9, or 10, sometimes 11, but... I need to have some time to myself. Yes. Okay? And then you say, but now that I, I'm going to have some time to myself, what do I do with that time? You do healthy things. Right. Right? Right. You have to set up some time to exercise every day. Mm-hmm. You start very mild, and then you go a little bit more moderate. The, 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 the standard that I always use is if you sweat a little bit, okay. but you could have a conversation, mm-hmm. then you're okay. That's mild. That's, fair. That's mild. So we're not trying moderate. to be bodybuilders. No, no, <laughs> And no. join a competition, right, right. Iron Man or Iron Woman. No, especially not at the beginning. <laughs> right, right, right. Especially at the beginning. Moderation. You don't want to hurt yourself, mm-hmm. right? So you go mild exercise, and then take a look at your diet. You yes. figure out: Am I eating healthy things, or am I eating unhealthy things? And you start switching a little bit from the healthy for the unhealthy unhealthy ones to the healthy ones, like. Fruits and vegetables and tuna all and chicken. All those things your mom told you to eat. All <laughs> those good things. Yes, absolutely. So you look at your exercise and you look at your diet. And then, very important, you look at your sleep. Mm. We have horrible sleep patterns. That's true. Right? Right. We're right. either watching television because we're having fun or we are worrying about our problems because, you know, we have a lot of problems and we cannot sleep. Mm-hmm. You need to have some sleep hygiene. Right? Okay. Do things that are going to foster your capacity to sleep. Sleep Mm -hmm. is extremely important. We could have a whole program on how to do that, right? right? right. You know, sleep hygiene. So I'm not going to go into (laughs) all the details because (laughs) we could spend hours talking about that. Right. But that's a whole topic on itself. So you have to exercise a little bit, Mm -hmm. eat better, have some sleep hygiene. Right. And now you're going to be surprised at the next, the next step. Okay. The next step is to find out what your values are. Ah, Find so, out what your values are, so what's important to a you. A deep dive into your values, start, start thinking about who you are. Yes, yes. Right? Who you come from. What is right yes. and what is wrong. And then then you take a look at what you do mm-hmm. and figure out if what you do matches your values. Hey, listen, in the pandemic, coming mm-hmm. out of it, a lot of people learned the jobs they were doing yes. were not the jobs for them coming out of it and through it and, you know, really making right. sincere career changes. Right. If your values don't match your behavior, you're not going to be happy. Uh, you're going to be stressed out. You're on your way to burned out. How long did it take you to learn that one? Oh, that takes a while. <laughs> that takes a while to learn. That takes a while. Right. I had a lot of nurses that uh, their value is to take high-quality care for the patient. Sure. And during the pandemic, the resources were so stretched that they did not feel mm. that they were 
keeping up to their values. Yes. It's not that they were neglectful. It's that the circumstances were so difficult for them. Did not allow them. them to do right. it, right. So part of my job was to convince them they hadn't done anything wrong. Mm. It wasn't their fault. Right. They were doing their best. But then they thought very hard as to, do I want to continue to do something mm. that it's not aligned with my personal values? Right. And different people took different decisions. But that's one of the reasons my, we might have some uh, healthcare professionals leaving the healthcare profession. Yes. Because they find that they can't do what they thought right. they could do. Right. So, you know, taking a look at your values is very important. Now, the next step is to learn a few things. Okay. Learn compassion. Mm. You can learn compassion. You can learn compassion. It's not innate within no, you. No, no, it's a that skill. That gives me courage as a leader. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so we can teach compassion. Absolutely. It okay. is a skill. Mm. It's a skill and you can practice it. And if you don't practice it, then you don't develop it. And you have to have compassion towards yourself. Yes. And you have to have compassion towards others. Now, one of the important things for you to learn compassion is to have someone be compassionate towards you. Okay. And to see how that feels. Mm. So many times when we encounter people who are very difficult, right. if we can have a little compassion, we could help them mm. towards the road to compassion. Right. Right. I'm right. not saying that this is easy. <laughs> right. Because one would think it's intuitive for yes. those who work in healthcare. Right. And, and take that assignment, vocation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then there's that burnout factor. Yes. That you mentioned earlier where the empathy. Right. Yes. And the compassion yes. just leaves because you're constantly under resourced. Yes. Right. And, yes. and pushed to the limits. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you find your voice? If we're talking about. Cultural barriers, we're mm -hmm. talking about uh, people of color mm -hmm. who rarely have the liberty mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. self-expression. Yes, right? yes, yes. How do you find the courage or what do you, you share with your uh, patients and professionals on finding the courage to say what needs to be said to build compassion and to, to really advocate for themselves and what their needs are for mental wellness. I usually what well, we I usually try to go to examples. Mm. Right? You know, this is this this happened to me, this is how I did it and it didn't work out too good. Or okay. this is what happened to me. <laughs> so this you is what the I stove, did. It burned, yes. Didn't that's touch it right. Again. That's right. <laughs> and and you know I tried this and this worked, so I think this is a good idea. Okay. But every individual has to come to this on their own mm. and they have to look at their own lives. I can help someone by talking about it, but I can't lead you right. towards compassion. This has to be something that comes from within you. Mm. But once you know that it is possible, right. compassion and you know also its counterpart, tolerance, right? right. Sometimes we're very intolerant. Okay, we all, right. we all are. Right. Okay, we right. all are intolerant in some degree or another with one thing or another. But once we start thinking about compassion and tolerance, and we need to remind ourselves, because this is not easy, you know, if you're very upset about something, That's true. Right. You, you, you're going to be angry, and then you have to remind yourself, okay, let me be a little compassionate about myself, mm -hmm. yes. because I have the right to be happy. Mm -hmm. I have the right to feel comfortable. and right. And... If I don't give me that right, nobody else is going to give it. So, to me. would you call that the individual bill of rights? Yes, yes, I guess so. The individual personal bill of rights. Absolutely, absolutely. And once you have experience on compassion, so it's nice to be compassionate to strangers, right? And to do uh, what? What was that? A random acts of, of kindness. kindness. Okay. Uh, so th I think that's important. Yes. If you could be decent. To everybody, even if it's a stranger, that's, that's right. a good thing. That's right. And you'll be surprised. Most people are like that. Mm -hmm. My experience in life is that if you give the chance of, to someone to be compassionate and caring, they take it. I agree. And they do it. There are barriers, again, to mm -hmm. that right. in the world we live. Yes. Uh, okay. But if you give someone a chance, they will take it. Um, in terms of uh, of uh, minorities, people of color, mm -hmm. you know, we have an added burden, okay, because of yeah. all the prejudice out there and all the experiences that we might have had that were right. negative. And unaddressed. And unaddressed. Right. Right. Repressed memories, mm -hmm. right? Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it is an added burden, but 
the one thing that I share with my patients and, uh, and, and with my friends and with my staff and with my family is that forgiveness yes. does more for the person that forgives than for the forgiven. Hmm. That's when, true. When you yes. forgive, you free yourself Absolutely. from hate, from anger, mm. from resentment. You give yourself permission yes. to let go of those bad emotions. You don't have to forget. Right. You don't have to say, you know, you, know, you don't have to be, what is it, Pollyanna, they call it. No, no. <laughs> right. The world is a right. tough place and That's there's right. bad people and there are bad situations. But you have permission to forgive and you give yourself per permission to let go of bad emotions mm -hmm. and open up for good emotions, mm -hmm. for feelings of happiness, for feelings of appreciation. We all want more, right? Right. right? right. You know, you, you know, I'm sure right. that, you know, the millionaires of this world will mm -hmm. like more. Right. 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 But we need to appreciate what we already have. Yes. Right? Yes. If you are in good physical health, mm -hmm. that is something that you need to be uh are thankful for it. Sure. If you have a house, then you have to be thankful for it. Mm -hmm. If you have a nice family, you have to be thankful for it. You might not be a millionaire. Even people, what they have found is that even very, very poor people can have very happy lives. That's true. Because right. they are appreciative right. of what they actually now, have. Now, granted, it would be nice if you had the housing security. Yes, yes <laughs> absolutely. Right, enough income to yes, take care of your basic needs. And, 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 good education, access. Yeah, and, and good places where you could buy good food. Absolutely. And where you right. could go and right. you could walk a few blocks. And if uh, there's a mental health provider yes. that is nice and kind and you feel at home, mm -hmm. that's, that would be ideal. Absolutely. But even in a non-ideal world, we have to find a way to achieve happiness. And the way mm -hmm. we do it is by taking care of ourselves right. and by embracing compassion and tolerance mm -hmm. and knowledge. Right. Right? The right. understanding that mental health, it's like any other kind of health. And you have a right to feel good. Right. And if you're feeling depressed or anxious, if you're hearing voices mm -hmm. and nobody else is hearing voices. And you're answering them. And you're answering them. <laughs> right. You have a right to be free of this. Right. You have a right to be free of this scourge. Yes. And how do we do that? We do that with therapy and we do that with medication. And, uh, and, and, and uh, you know, we shouldn't have all the, the barriers that, that mm -hmm. we have. And, and I just, you know, again, we, we've covered a lot of ground mm -hmm. um, that typically takes years to get to for self-introspection. Right. You know, individual personal bill of rights. Right. Giving yourself permission to feel the way you feel. To yes. not feel so great. Yes. Um, and then acknowledging that and seeking help. Um, really, today we have more access, which is what you shared. Medication is better today. Yes. Right? Where in years past, uh, it really um, has advanced. Mm -hmm. uh, also having cultural providers. Yes. Right? Who, Absolutely. Who are going into the field all critical for the understanding of a global world mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. cultures to understand uh, not that you're wrong the way you were raised or your experience are not validated. Right. Right. But having right. that compassion, that sensitivity uh, and making sure we're tolerant of each other. And as an individual, um, all comes into play. Uh, so how do you take I, I'm going to say 10 steps back uh -huh. with just a slow process if you're not in a scheduled treatment setting uh -huh. to know that you may need to access professional help and it's uh -huh. OK. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. If you find, well, first of all, horrible things happen to people, mm. right? If a horrible thing happens to you, well, you're going to be at a high risk for needed mental health services. So when bad things are happening to you, it's a time to say, wait a minute, do I need a little extra help? Yes. Now, having said that, some people develop the same way that some very skinny people develop diabetes. Some people with right. no problems whatsoever develop depression Yes, because there's a biological component to it. You cannot change your genes. Mm -hmm. And there's a, you know, a genetic component to physical illness and there's a genetic component to mental illness. So if you're feeling depressed, if you're feeling anxious, if you're having thoughts about harming yourself, if you're hearing voices, 
if you're behaving in ways that are creating severe trouble for you right. with your family, at work, uh, it's time to, to seek some help. And a professional can listen to you and say, oh, no, no, this is simple. This is what you need to do. Or, yeah, we need a little bit of right. extra help. And this, it's the same analogy from diabetes. Diabetes is such a good analogy, right? If right. you get diabetes, well, you might need to exercise and you may need to lose some weight and you might need to take some medication. And if you do all of them, you get better. And right. maybe you don't need medication later on. The same thing with mental illness. If you're depressed or anxious, you might need some therapy and you might need some medication and you might need some lifestyle changes. You That's do all of, Right? Mm -hmm. You do all of that in a little while, then maybe you don't need the medication anymore. And maybe your life is better. I don't sure. see any difference. Good. And I agree with you. I really want to thank you for taking time for joining me on their Sumter About It. Uh, you are just fabulous in breaking it down so we can understand it and understanding that cultural barriers should be minimized because uh, we do have some great professionals in the field. Should not be ashamed to access them really work to be enlightened. And if people are interested, go to different sites to learn more, ask the tough questions and make the determinations for themselves, but be mindful of their mental wellness as well as their physical health. So I really want to thank you. Is there anything you want to leave our audience with today? Oh, well, it's my pleasure to be here. This was a wonderful conversation. It, uh, it basically took you back 10 years <laughs> when we were in the cafeteria talking about, you know, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to fix the yes, world? Uh, yes. And we can't fix the world, but we could help people get better. Absolutely. And, That's the goal. And, and as I say, when I, as I used to say, and mm -hmm. I keep, to say, keep saying, you know, let's keep fighting mental illness everywhere we find it. Yes. There we go. Thank you. You heard it here first. Thank you, Dr. Wan, for joining us on There's Sumter About It. Thank you so much. There's Sumter About It, a podcast from WBGO Studios. Like and subscribe wherever you get your podcast or go to wbgo.org slash studios. Associate producer, Regina Wilder. Produced by Jamara Wakefield. Engineered by Corey Goldberg. Executive produced by Billy Robinson.